Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm back again with Lengthy and Arthur, the uh, my ANCAP friend from uh, from America. All right. Hello everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, I got an email a few months ago about uh, circumcision from someone who is very passionate about it, and it's something that I've been vaguely aware of for a while, but never really looked into, and thought that it would, might make a uh, an interesting topic of discussion. Topic of discussion, and I know that uh, you you, that is, uh, LinkedIn and Arthur, are uh, interested in that topic. I've seen a few videos by you, but um, I I was interested to see what the big deal was, because it seems like a lot of people think it isn't a big deal, and there's a few, a few people who think it very much is a big deal, which is the camp that I'm now moving into. Um, and I thought that perhaps we could uh, perhaps drum up some enthusiasm for the subject uh, by having yeah. a conversation about it. It, it really is. I mean, a lot of people do take it uh, very personally. I, I kind of fall mid-range on that spectrum uh, in terms of how personally I take it. But independent of that, it's actually a really fascinating topic that uh, intersects you know, religion, the rights of parents, the rights of uh, bodily integrity of, of children, of uh, religion, of hygiene. There's a lot of interesting stuff about the history of medicine. Um, there's various different types of circumcision and it ha has various different roles. Society. It's actually fairly widespread. A lot of um, anti-circumcision people in the United States like to say, well, circumcision is very rare. And that's not really true. It's about a third of the men on the planet, probably. They don't know exactly really? are circumcised. So it's not, a, it's not that rare. Um, now, the main reason for that is that it's very common among Muslims, and Muslims make up a very yeah. large portion of the, of the population. And then it's also almost universal among Jews, which make up, you know, a, statistically an insignificant part of the world's population. And then it's also very popular in the United States, yeah. which is, after all, one of the most, I think it's what, the third most populated is, uh, country in the world. So yeah. um, those well, taken together. I think that's probably one of the most interesting things about it is the, the adoption by the United States and the fact that they've held on to it despite no religious reasons for doing so. Yes, and that's a, that's a trend that uh, the other English field, so if you look at Europe in general, France, Spain, uh, Germany, circumcision was never widely practiced in any of those places, um, except among Jews or Muslims. Um, it, it can't say that it's never happened because there are certain times where it, it would happen, but it was never a, a general practice. In the English-speaking world, it became medicalized in the 19th century in England, and, and then following the lead of England as uh, were all the Commonwealth countries, and then, you know, kind of ironically, the United States, even though the United States broke away from England and kind of distinguishes itself from the UK in lots of ways. Um, it definitely followed the UK in, in that in, in, in the practice of medicalized circumcision in the late 19th century. Um, but what's interesting is in the UK, it became uncommon um, uh, in the late 40s. Uh, and the rates, we don't know for sure, but in the UK, they think they maxed around 30% in, say, the 20s and the 30s. So if you look at men in the UK who were born in the 20s, or 30s, which, you know, there's probably still a few around, mm -hmm. um, you know, their odds of being circumcised are quite high. But from the 40s on, the rates have dropped. I think that they're less than 10% are circumcised at this point. Um, and we see a similar pattern, but uh, delayed in, say, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and in the United States. Um, okay. Yeah, well, in the UK, just um, to come off that, is uh, it, it was just something that I had never even heard of until I literally read about it in the Bible, and um, I remember asking my dad what it was, and he gave a very brief uh, summary. Um, speaking of my parents, actually, I know that there are a lot of people watching this, uh, including my parents, who might not be comfortable watching me talking about uh, penises, sex, um, foreskins, all of the nasty details. Uh, if, uh, usually I'm quite prudish on my channel, uh, but I think in this video I don't want to hold anything back. I want to talk about orgasms, sexual intercourse, you know, Hygiene, it's, all of that stuff. It's hard. Mentioned. It's hard to avoid. Uh, well, you can sanitize it to a point, uh, only so far. Um, so that's that's actually one of the interesting things because what you tend to have, there aren't that many cultures in the world where there's a big mix, right? So in Israel, circumcision is almost universal, and so every all all men uh, um, are circumcised, expect to be circumcised, or nearly all. There's there's always some minority that. And then all women are accustomed to having circumcised men. And in the United States, this has also been historically true. This is starting to change, but it, historically, almost all men, in, in the last hundred years anyway, if we go back to the 19th century, this would not be true. But 
um, almost all men would be circumcised and all women would have all their experience would be circumcised men. Uh, but then if you go to, you know, the UK, circumcision is now quite rare. Uh, and so unless you're talking to somebody who grew up in the first two or three decades of the 20th century, they're not going to have experience with circumcision. Everyone's going to be uncircumcised. And that yeah. kind of... It's very normal. Uh, means, it's very normal. And yeah. so there's a, there's an interesting effect of the minority people, uh, the minority status in each country kind of has a, um, a sense of alienation. So a lot of uncircumcised men in the United States feel like they are different and it's not, I mean, they are literally different in that mm, sense. Yeah. Uh, they feel um, alienated uh, and shame. And also, uh, it's, I don't think it's as widespread, but there are definitely circumcised men in the UK who feel the same way mm. uh, from the opposite. I'm just in preparation for our talk, I was doing some research, and there, there are indeed entire websites in the UK dedicated to circumcised men in the UK and what their experiences are like. And they're, in a, in a certain way, are kind of the mirror of those experiences of uncircumcised men in the U.S., but from, uh, I, I, th I think this has changed, but when I was growing up, we were taught in school that uh, foreskins were bad, that they were um, dirty, that they spread diseases, which is not, I mean, it's a part of your body that can have diseases, so that's not yeah. completely false. Um, it's just uh, the, the way it was yeah, taught is very bad. If you don't have it, then you, you can't get it diseased or dirty, so right. it's not exactly yeah. like any other part of your body. Yeah, I mean, if if we take out your tonsils or your appendix, appendix, you won't have any diseases associated with those yeah. either. Yeah, you made um, a parody video about uh, scalping scalping men at birth, was it, or scalping all children at birth, um, right. as, as an Stop analogy up. for circumcision. Um, yeah, so it was, uh, you know, the they when I was in uh, fifth grade was when they taught us health, and my fifth grade teacher was a woman, and I think there was some feeling that um, it should be a man who talks to the boys. So we the class divided to boys and girls and they brought in a different fifth grade teacher who was a man and they didn't just teach us about foreskin the whole class was not about yeah. circumcision but they got to that point and you have to understand that all the medical textbooks in the United States any any book picked penises they're almost always going to depict a circumcised penis and they've actually done um, studies of medical textbooks and they will have no either no pictures of foreskins and no information about their function, how they work, how to clean them. The only thing it teaches doctors is how to remove them. Yeah. Uh, so, so the 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 degree that it's normalized is you know almost absolute, and it's all it's taught that if somebody isn't circumcised, that that's unusual. Mm. Um, so there's actually a debate in the the group that will they don't like to say uncircumcised because that's like calling a woman who hasn't been had her breast removed unmysectomized. Yeah. Why would you or uncircumcised because you know, that is the norm for women as well. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, would you call a woman who hasn't had a clitorectomy uncircumcised? No, yeah. you would just say she's a woman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, although that is that does make it hard to have a conversation about it. I mean, I can understand why you would want to do the you know differentiation that way. And it's also confusing because most people don't. That's that's jargon that's associated with an attacktivist movement, yeah. which most people are not uh, familiar with. Most people say it's circumcised or uncircumcised, cut mm -hmm. or uncut. But yeah, the, we, we were taught that they're dirty, that they spread disease, and, you know, they didn't come and check us all to make sure, but they said, if any of you are uncircumcised, you must be very careful that you don't constantly get sick. And I can just imagine if any of my classmates at the time had actually been uncircumcised, they would have felt very singled out. Let's say you're in the class and they're just saying, hypothetically, if you're uncircumcised, you're going to be really dirty. Right. You're going to okay. sitting there as one kid who is uncircumcised, you're going to be probably worried, oh, what am I going to think? And this is actually one of the most common um, arguments given when parents are asked, why would you have your son circumcised? Because the, the arguments are not very good. Yeah. Um, they're not very strong arguments. Even the proponents will admit that the medical benefits are, you know, on very, very low uh, and, and they're not necessities. But people will say things like, well, I don't want my, they'll say that they want the son to look like the father. And yeah. again, how many sons have gone around saying, I, hey, my penis doesn't look like my dad's, it's bothering me. Mm -hmm. That's a very unusual, uh, uh, right? But then the other thing they'll say is we don't want our son to be made fun of yeah. because what is in the locker room, uh, yeah. shower, and um, that's not a completely unwarranted, look, uh, you know, hazing and being made fun of mm -hmm. is going to happen. Even if every boy yeah. was circumcised, every boy was uncircumcised, that would still happen. And of course, if you had a boy who was different, it could happen. It's just 
communal showering like that is no longer common. Uh, it's, that's actually quite rare in the United States. It used to be common up until the 80s. Okay. Um, so, uh, there. I mean, the, the first time I saw an uncircumcised penis was in a communal shower when I was 17. And we had learned enough to know that's what that was. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like... Um, so it wasn't a shock in that sense. For, for contrast, um, I, it was probably until probably the age of about eighteen that I could properly describe what a foreskin was. I mean, I haven't, I couldn't use the scientific terms. Only just recently, in the last few weeks, learned those. But I didn't even know what a foreskin was because it, because the distinction between the shaft skin and the foreskin is not an important one in the UK. It's, it's not, yeah, it's like, yeah. it's just part of the penis. It's not even There's, a different part. It's just, it's all it's all the penis. It, it's not a part of it that's a foreskin and part of it that isn't. Yeah. That makes you'll, sense. you'll find among, in the United States, uh, the foreskin is almost always referred to in very trivializing and arbitrary language to say it's a piece of extra skin or a flap mm. of extra skin yeah. or part of the penis. Or they'll say, um, for, circumcision does not harm the penis. It just removes the foreskin. It's like, yeah. That the is foreskin the penis. Is, yeah, like there isn't the the foreskin is not a separate structure mm. from a penis. You yeah. know, it's like you know, um, we didn't damage your car; we just tore off the bumper. <laughs> yeah. I, like the bumper is part of the car. Yeah. You know, um, and that's actually a, one one a very um, rhetorically uh, important distinction. Uh, and yeah, almost all the information. Uh, one of the, the ways they can justify the act is to say, look, the foreskin is not part of the penis. It's this other thing yeah. that's separate. And so we're not damaging the penis at all. We're just removing this part. And it's true. It is, it's an integrated whole that, that it all functions together. And this is what's yeah, well, kind your of car, so Your car would work without the bumper in the same yeah. sense. It would People still be say, car. well, I, I was size and I'm, I feel fine. And it's like, well, it's true. You can still walk around. There's lots of parts of your body that we mm. could amputate and die and you'd still be able to procreate. And yet that's not an argument to have them removed. Uh, I think the, a clear example here would be obviously female circumcision, which people are loath to compare, but really they are very similar. There are some distinctions to be made, but in principle and in, in fact, they are quite similar. So can we talk about what is lost? Because that was something interesting I learned from um, Eric Klopper's uh, lecture that I watched uh, just a few days ago. That um, I think we'll talk about that more. But specifically, um, can you just go over what you know of the um, the actual benefits of a foreskin? Because we we talked about a little bit about the 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 side effects you might call or the the disadvantages of having a foreskin that are widely reported in the in the US but there's a lot of advantages that the foreskin gives that Eric Klopper talks about in his lecture that I found that were you know really interesting and probably would make its own you'd probably be able to convince a lot of people not to circumcise their children just by listing the benefits you don't even have to go into the cultural thing the rights the anything I mean obviously you can but I think the benefits are really where you're going to win people over but this is where there is the most contention, right? Um, the the calculus for justifying circumcision is based on the they, in the past medical circumcision was justified by making very extravagant claims about its benefits. It would protect you from syphilis. It would protect you from gonorrhea. It would protect you from becoming effeminate. It would stop you from masturbating. And these all these claims that were in time, you know, rebutted and, and termed discovered to be bunk. And the claims that they offer today, most of them are bunk. Some of them are true, but they're, you know, like, yes, it's cleaner, but any if you remove any bit of flesh, that flesh will no longer be dirty. Yeah. Solistically. It's not a big problem to remit. But yeah, showering so regularly is, like, much more common than it used to be. Yeah, yeah. If we're talking about a society that lacks soap and running water, there might be a better argument than, than today. Um, so the advocates will admit, well, yes, the medical benefits are quite small, However, nothing is lost. There's no downside, right? Like, um, and that means the calculus means well, you should do it, right? If you have a, if you have something that's not very beneficial, but it's a little beneficial, and there's no cost, you know, you should do it. Whereas if there's a high cost, yeah, then then, then that doesn't make sense. Now, of course, there's costs just associated with the surgery because there are complications. There are babies who lose a lot of blood, who become infected. Uh, there are some babies who die. It's rare, but in the United States, we're probably talking about a hundred babies or so a year, which is wow. not a not an insignificant amount. And that's, by the way, why it was ended in the UK. Uh, you had really? a, 
a, a pediatric surgeon in the UK in the 40s who said, there's no medical reason to do this. We are losing about 100 babies a year. It should be stopped. And I'll give credit to the NHS. The NHS said we'll no longer cover it. And the rates plummeted mm, as, as a result. Okay. Um, but uh, the logic there then, though, is based on the false assumption that the loss of the foreskin is in itself a cause of harm. I mean, there's there's the harm caused by the bot circumcisions and the and the babies who die get infected. Yeah. Or even, even when if, it goes yeah. well, you're still going through a surg surgical procedure that is not comfortable for the the baby. It's still not a pleasant yeah. experience, or even a neutral one. It's you're definitely negative. You're definitely imposing a, a trauma on the baby. There's a question of what the effects of that trauma ultimately are, and the, to be perfectly frank, it has not been researched. All right, they don't do yeah. studies where they take circumcised and uncircumcised cohorts of, of individuals and test them to discover so there, there's been a few we do know that it lowers um pain threshold so circumcised mm. uh, searchers in canada for instance were noticing that when they were immunizing one-year-olds uh, the the boys all seem to have a much stronger reaction they cry a lot more they fidget a lot more and the girls seem to take the shots very well and so the researchers thought oh maybe boys are like puss you know not <laughs> you know they're they're more pain sensitive and so they just studied it, and it turned out that it wasn't all the boys. It was only the circumcised boys. The uncircumcised mm. had the same reaction as the girls, and so they published a study. Uh, so you have – this is a, these would be people who a year after the circumcision would still be exhibiting this, and we don't know how long it lasts. Yeah. But uh, th but those are those are negative things that are imposed, and there's a lot of debate about them. But in terms of positive things, which is what the question is um, – the force can evolve. Like it's not a fluke, and it's not um, something that is vestigial. A lot of people yeah. say, "Oh, it's like your appendix. Uh, it's a, it's a part of your body that you don't need." Uh, yeah. Foreskins evolved. Uh, almost all mammals have foreskins. Um, among the great apes, it's, it's very fascinating. They can count the number of Meisner's corpuscles and other nerves in them. And humans have the most of all the great apes. Uh, and and this the is most this nerves. Is, that is, you said the yeah nerves. Yeah, yeah uh, just nerve chain. They have yeah. specialized cells called Meisner's corpuscles, which you find on the tips of your fingers and on your lips, and then also on the tip of the foreskin. Uh, and there's some debate about whether it's the most sensitive part of the penis or just as sensitive as any other part. Um, I'll have, yeah. I've had pro-circumcision people say, oh, it's not the most sensitive part. It's just as sensitive as all the other parts. Like That doesn't mean that it would be okay to cut it off. If we could find that your pinky finger wasn't the most sensitive finger, that would not be mm -hmm. an argument for removing yeah. the... Thank you. I think it's also um, it's also important to make the distinction between sensitive and pleasurable, if that makes sense. So your, your lips and fingertips are sensitive, but that doesn't mean it feels good to rub them. It's just that you can feel it. I mean, it's I'm, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying that's an important distinction, I think. Yes. It, it, um, it, I mean, they can it can sense heat, heat differences and temperature, too. But yeah. um, is it erogenous? You know, yes, would that's be, what, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't and know if there's a way they can actually tell if it is or not. I mean, you ha you have to go on surveys of people, and it's very difficult because um, you can you can't you can't judge people who were circumcised as, as infants; they have no memory. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are uncircumcised, they have nothing to compare it for to. So they can say, "Well, I feel good," but they don't know what they're feeling that a circumcised person might not be feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then you're left with people who are circumcised after sexual maturity, and the problem there is that you're always dealing with a selection bias. You have right. guys who have chosen to get circumcised, maybe for ideological reasons. You know, I, I know some people who got circumcised in their 30s, and it was because they felt great shame for being uncircumcised. Okay, yeah. and they're an adult, they should be able to choose that, but then anything that they report after is going to be colored by that. And the same yeah. for, say, men who decide to regrow their foreskins, restore them. If they say after, I feel a lot better, it feels amazing, you can correctly and very easily say, well, you are you are so into foreskins that of course you're going to say that. Even if you're not lying, you could... Yeah, you yeah, could, yeah. Uh, it's the placebo, placebo, yeah. The placebo effect alone can explain. Uh, and so and I think you'd have to do a study of men who were circumcised like accidentally, like maybe in car mm. accidents who had no you know, interest in having it done. Or you'll have guys who get circumcised because they do have a problem. Maybe they have phimosis, maybe they have balanitis. You know, maybe they were getting it. Yeah. And then he gets circumcised. He goes, yeah, I feel a lot better. And it's like, well, the, he, he was the, the the lowest one half of 1% in terms of. So the bottom line is there's definitely cells there. There are cells that are sensitive. Um, 
So you're removing those. So there's definitely going to be a loss of that. I don't. There's just logically no way around that. Um, the other part, and this is thing, something that a lot of circumcised men don't understand, and a lot of uncircumcised men take completely for granted, is that the, circum the foreskin is not. It, it's dynamic when sex is involved. When, when, when an uncircumcised man is masturbating or having sex, the foreskin is not uninvolved. Mm. Um, it's gliding on and off the head. Uh, it's it's functionally very important in any kind of sexual act, and, th and this is something. So I'll have some circumcised men say, "Oh well," and I even had a, a Jewish doctor tell me this once uh, that, look, the foreskin is just a cap. It's just a cap for the head. The head is the is the is the most important part, yeah. and the foreskin just is there to protect it. And since we have clothing now, we no longer need foreskins. Right. And it's like, if it's if it's just a protective cap, why does it have any nerves at all? Yeah. I, uh, and yeah, your clothing it, isn't a replacement for a foreskin. I should. <laughs> that's the other I guess thing. you're going to go into that, but the the inner well, the, but that's the important distinction. The, yeah. the for the, for those who don't know, if they're circumcised, the inside of a foreskin is about the very similar to the inside of your lips. You know, it's a mucosal, so smooth membrane. Uh, even if you wear silk, that's not analogous to that. And yeah, if you're wearing, yeah. well, it's much more abrasive and it's much drier. So that's just false. We could probably create a synthetic foreskin that's close, but nobody is wearing that. Yeah, there was an episode uh, of Friends where uh, Monica made one for Joey. That was like one of the very first encounters I had with circum circumcised and uncircumcised penis was in episodes of Friends about It's that. a little tricky when they don't show anything. You know, like you said, so you oh, don't yeah, actually... Yeah. She shows what? like some little, um, some little foreskins that she makes that it just basically caps. She makes them out of like different meats. <laughs> so, well, so yeah, you know, my... People say, "Well, it's just a cap, and that's wh then why is it invenerated? Why does it have nerves, and why is it sensitive?" But then the other thing is, it, during sex, it doesn't just come off and it's off. It goes on and mm -hmm. off. It slides mm -hmm. on and off repeatedly. Uh, the other interesting thing is when it pulls back. The most sensitive part of the foreskin in most surveys is the very tip. Um, that's where most of the nerves are, uh, and when at, at peak thrust, that pulls back, and that area is now on a ring around the shaft. And that actually lines up with the most sensitive areas in the vagina. So it's not like this is, you know, some accident of, of you know, some vestigial thing. It's involved in the, you have the most sensitive part of the male uh, stimulating the most sensitive part of the female. I mean, yeah, and... Sounds like a good and, recipe for, uh, for some, you know, marital bliss. And, and, and I, I'm, you know, now that we'll risk, if we haven't already cro crossed into like the... Um, too Not explicit. Safe for <laughs> yeah, like for me, like I, my, I'm, I'm for those who hadn't assumed, I'm, I'm circumcised. Uh, I was born in the 80s in the United States when I think the circumcision rates were probably over 90 percent for newborns. There's some debate about when it exactly peaked, and they've since collapsed. They've come down to now around 50 percent. So there has been a change in the United States, um, but. Uh, you know, I felt fine. I didn't have a botched circumcision, so-called. There are people who do, who have major problems, but that's relatively rare. Uh, and that certainly wasn't me. I was happy, and I was blissfully, you know, this. I, I didn't have anything to compare it to when I had orgasms. They felt fine. Uh, and it was after I became sexually active, and, uh, you know, for those who don't know, I'm also gay. Uh, like, I started meeting men, and, of course, most of the people that I met were circumcised. Uh, when I started to meet uncircumcised men, uh, it was immediately apparent that they were having qualitatively different experiences. Mm -hmm. And I know that's, you know, it's qualitative, so it's difficult to quantify, but I'll just say that um, stimulation, like a similar degree of stimulation between the two produced a much stronger reaction from the uncircumcised man. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get too graphic here. Yeah. And there are bell curves, so it's not like every circumcised guy feels the same circumcised guys feels the same there's definitely some overlap but uh circumcised uh, uncircumcised men are much much more and i want to just say sensitive much more erogenous right they have a really really good time with stuff that produces no effect in a circumcised mm. man yeah i mean presumably there's also some cultural differences i'm just if if this was a study i'd be writing this in, sure. the, in the confounding factors section of the discussion <laughs> for sure well, like the the cultures uh, were different and you know i don't know how uh, how different as a consequence of that how different the men were i mean you already discussed all that i'm just uh, they do the the removal of the foreskin will change uh what it requires for a man to get off he needs mm -hmm. more pressure more friction um a a uncircumcised man 
needs less stimulation and it produces a stronger result. Uh, so there's a lot of stories of um, uh, American American men having to be much rougher. Um, it's also gay men. Oh, you uh, mean? You mean oh, sorry. No. Story the the stories that I've read. I don't think gay men are going to report rough and complain about it. Um, <laughs> it's more uh, like European females uh, reporting that American men are much rougher in bed mm. um, because the, there is so much less sensitivity on the average circumcised penis that like, and I can, I mean, there's, there's things you, if very light touching on a uncircumcised guy can usually produce a pretty long result. But with a, with a circumcised man, you have to actually apply a lot of pressure and a lot of friction to generate even, you know, not, not even the same amount, but any, any reaction at all. Okay. Um, so, it, it, well, and so it's not just what's removed because the, the fact that the glands is now exposed all the time means the glands itself, even though it's still there, will lose a lot of sensitivity. Yeah, that's because um, it's rubbing against the clothing. Is that right? It's not being protected anymore? Yeah. This is this is something, and again, it's so, it's so interesting because it's difficult to to for each side to understand this. But if I, if for any of your uncircumcised listeners, just imagine um, if you were to re retract the skin and use some tape or a string to keep it back, and then just go, you know, put on your clothes and have a normal day. Now, a circumcised guy is going to hear that and be like, "Why? What's the big deal?" But an mm -hmm. uncircumcised guy is probably going to be like, "I don't think I could do that because it would be extremely either irritating or even painful." Yeah, because the, the head of the penis rubbing up the exposed head of the penis rubbing up against clothing, even even though that's not particularly abrasive, it's not like you know yeah, even steel, soft clothing. Yeah, it, it it's really really irritating, even even painful. And yet, imagine a circumcised guy does that every single day, his whole life, and he never he doesn't even feel it at all. Like yeah. the the sensitivity has been reduced so much that what would make an uncircumcised guy wince. Or you know, or at least feel tickled, and they they do very. Uh, a circumcised man won't even feel that, right? So that's 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 on the part that remains, minus of course everything that's completely gone. Um, and then the other thing which we've touched on before is just the fact that there's mobility. So uncircumcised men when they masturbate tend to pull the skin on and off the head. Um, some of them though are long enough that they don't even pull it off at all. Whereas circumcised men obviously can't do that at all. Uh, and they will rub the head directly with their hand, or you have they to use will use lotion, right? That's what uh, use, Popper said. Use lube. So, circumcised men use lube, not all the time, but I, it's a very large majority of the time. Whereas uncircumcised men, it's quite rare. I mean, yeah. I, we won't say that it never happens or that it can't happen, but it's much rare. So there are fun. There are functionally completely. It, it's functionally impacting. There's, so you can still have children, and so people say, well, you can still have ch children, and you can still orga orgasm. So there's no change, and it's mm -hmm. like, no, they clearly are changes that are taking place yeah to be honest i think the um what was uh, i don't know if it's scientifically rigorous or not but the the studies that uh, eric clopper was talking about in his lecture he mentioned a few um, I, some of them were studies and some of them were just um what do you call them deductions about how um uncircumcised men um, are able to satisfy women more um, give women more orgasms because they can last longer um, and like you said, they don't have to be as rough. There's just the technique is different, and it's actually um, it's more satisfying for the sexual partners if, if they're women, or I suppose if they're men as well. But I think that is uh, it's such an like such an obviously good thing. Like even if it was only a two percent difference in um, in the in the quality of the sexual encounters, I feel like that would be incredibly persuasive for for men. It's like do. You, <laughs> It's that's a two percent difference every time you have sex and every time you masturbate and every time every yeah, time. Yeah, for the rest of your life. So yeah. That and and the thing is, you can I you know through the, through the networks. I've I've talked to men who did get circumcised in adulthood and then later regretted it and then later restored their foreskins and they were able. Look again, there's placebo and there's bias. There's bias yeah, here. Yeah. Um, but uh, one I've heard it from a couple. They said, well, sex when you're intact when you have your foreskin. Is like let's let's say that's a ten on the scale. That's the best feeling that they've ever had. Okay. And then when they become uncircumcised, or sorry, excuse me, when they become circumcised, it's more like a two, a two wow. or a three. Yeah. Uh, now, and the other thing to know is like the the head being exposed, it will slowly lose sensitivity. So a lot of times, guys will get circumcised 
and for the first year or two, they'll actually feel like they're more sensitive because they're yeah. constantly getting uh, irritated. But the head will uh, develop a callus. It's called keratization. It's like the same thing that happens on your callus hands. Wow. And that will protect it. Or it's a defensive mechanism, but it will also reduce sensitivity. And so I've also noticed that if you uh, a guy who's 20 versus a guy who's 30 or 40 and they're all circumcised, the younger ones are going to be more sensitive than the older ones. Uh, and this, again, has not been studied, but I think it's very likely that uh, a lot of the things that we associate with aging, you know, erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. sensitivity, a lot of that is exacerbated, if not necessarily directly caused, by the fact that the heads are exposed and they're going to deteriorate a lot faster than if they're covered. Yeah, I mean, this even goes to the, you know, if we even accept the argument of this Jewish doctor I was talking to, that it's just a cover, well, if you have to keep the cover off all the time, it's going to deteriorate faster yep. than if it had the cover. Uh, uh, you know, I guess you could say, well, I think your clothes are better covered, but the clothes are not designed to do that, so it would be very unusual. But so yeah, this guy was saying that uh, it's like a two or a three circumcised, and then he waited, and this the, guy, the main guy I'm thinking about here waited, I think, 20 years before he regained, he regrew his foreskin. Which does not get you exactly what you had before, but it gets you a lot of the function back. Yeah, and you're basically stretching it. For people who don't know, it's just a, a device that stretches it, right? Yeah, well, not necessarily a device. There's actually an ancient history here. Uh, Jews used to do it uh, to get along in the Greek, uh, Greek and Roman uh, society. They would use strings, they'd use little stones, they'd use manual methods. Um, you can't get the specialized tissues, like if your friend limb is destroyed, if the um, this really sensitive tip of the foreskin is gone, you can't get that back. Yeah. But you can regrow skin enough that it recovers your head, and then you get that skin mobility back. And that's mm. actually really, really important. The head becomes more sensitive, and then uh, you get that mobility, which is functionally really, really important. So this guy was saying once he restored, that was back to a 7 or an 8 mm. on the scale. So from 10 to 2 to 7, I've talked to other guys who got circumcised not beyond any choice of theirs, but basically because doctors told them that they had to. Uh, and I've heard this repeatedly where doctors would say, look, there's no difference, you'll be fine. And they're telling this to a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid. You know, they, they're not going to know any better. The doctor says they'll feel fine. And I remember one guy in particular said that, you know, so he got circumcised. He said after he was circumcised, it was like all of his feeling was gone. He said he could, quote, feel nothing after that. Oh. And he said he cried himself to sleep for months. Uh, and... Uh, he's now trying to restore. Now, not everyone who gets circumcised has that story. Mm -hmm. There's plenty who will have an opposite story, but there's plenty. I, I, just the other day, I was reading about a guy in the UK who uh, just had his frontal limb removed. He didn't even get fully circumcised. He had his mm -hmm. frontal limb removed. Uh, apparently, the NHS lied and said they were going to trim it, but they took the whole thing off. And he said he can't have sex anymore. The, the, there's like, the, it, it feels. Can you, can you describe what the frenulum is, please? Uh, maybe I'll put a graphic up on on the screen. Or something, uh, yeah, but just so remind the, me because I can't remember. The, the frenulum, frenulum is a, a little bridge of skin on the underside. Uh, what would be the the, pec, the pectoral side? Yeah, the, the uh, of the of the of the penis shaft, and it connects the glands or the penis head to the foreskin. And okay. when men are circumcised. Uh, that's one of the things that varies quite a bit. Some circumcised men have this completely removed and others have it just damaged significantly. Um, and in some of the sensitivity surveys, this is often cited as the most sensitive spot. Some people call it the male G-spot. G Again, this varies from individual to individual, but there are plenty of guys who, if you just simulate just that one little spot, and we're talking about less than a square centimeter, that's all it takes to get them to have an orgasm. Uh, now, so this is, but it's a relatively small area, and you know, I was just reading on Reddit from a guy who had just that removed, and he was like, "I all the sensitivity is gone, sex doesn't feel like anything, and like, he didn't say it, but he was almost sounding suicidal. Now, not everybody reports that, and so we should take that into account with the people who say, yeah, I don't really feel a difference. Um, but you should definitely be aware of that before you go and have your son circumcised. You know, what you could be, he could be missing out. It's just kind of interesting because if you obliterate, if you destroy it when they're a child, they will just never know. Mm. And, you know, so you might be at a two, but if two is all you know, yeah. then, you know, so, and, and, and that's what happened to me. I felt fine, but when I started seeing and in interacting with uncircumcised men, it became pretty clear that they were feeling and experiencing things that I wasn't. And not only that, things that I probably couldn't quite imagine. Um, yeah, I think it might be the responsibility of 
uh, maybe not responsibility, but I feel like it might really help if a lot of um, un, uh, what do you call them? Uh, intact, not uncut, but I think intact is a better word. If um, more European intact men and the you know the women who have had sex with them or the men who have had sex with them would be more, if we could be more vocal about it. Of course, there's a taboo about talking about sex and genitals in general, but I feel like if Right. More, if more women came forward and said, like, there's nothing dirty about the foreskin, there's nothing disgusting about it, it doesn't make the penis look weird, like, it's, uh, and just talked about, you know, more anecdotal experience, I feel like it could be really persuasive, just, to, you know. I 100% I, I agree, because you have, in the United States, you have these uh, people saying, look, foreskin's worthless, it has, it means nothing, it's just, it's just a source of problems, and, you know, maybe those problems aren't great, but that's all it is, and then there's silence. You know, because yeah, we don't you know have, any difference either. You, know? you have you have some circumcised men who are complaining about it, but then you could very easily say, "Look, you don't even know what you're talking about, right? You've never felt it." So, to and and actually, this was another thing. You know, when I was first getting interested in this, I remembered all the stuff I had heard about people getting sick, and I had some friends in the UK. And when I knew, knew them well enough that it wasn't awkward, and these were uh, heterosexual friends, um, you know, one of the first things I said was, "Well, how often did you get infected?" Right? Because I had been taught. You know, foreskin is equal infection. Mm. You know, so I said, did you, you know, I was imagining that like every month he was coming down with gangrene. You know, that's just the impression that was given to me. Yeah. Uh, but still the impression like this Jewish doctor I was talking to was saying, well, you should see all the guys I see in the in the hospital. Like, yeah, you're in a city with a million people and you saw five men with, you know, dirty foreskins. Mm. Like, um, and, you know, my friend was like, I never got infected. I never had a problem. Yeah. And, most people don't. Some people have problems, and most of the problems are pretty minor and easily fixed. I've talked to some guys here who said, yeah, when they went through puberty, they started to get a little soreness, and so they just started to clean it more regularly, and it went yeah. away, and that was it. Uh, and so that testimony really had a big effect on me, because I'm like, well, wait, apparently, clearly the medical hazards that it represented were exaggerated to me, right? And, which isn't to say they're completely lies, but they're clearly exaggerated. Mm. So yeah, there's there's probably as many uncircumcised men in the United States as there are in the UK, if not more, okay. just because of the population. Yeah. But they they don't. There's no organization of intact Americans. They don't speak out. Very few of them. They've kind of been shamed. And there's also just hey, they they feel fine. They yeah. don't know what is necessarily the big deal. They can take it for granted, uh, and so they don't come up and so it's quite rare actually among it's quite rare for intactivists to actually include intact men there's a few uh but yeah. it's actually, they don't really care <laughs> yeah why should they right you know yeah. uh, like the it even though there's elements within the medical establishment in the united states that are doing their very best to you know eradicate circumcised men they only they only are targeting babies and this is another interesting thing about the history um when medical circumcision started, got got traction in the 1860s and 70s, and the 1870s is kind of the pivotal decade when it started to become ever more popular, uh, doctors could not convince adult men to get circumcised. It was very, yeah. very difficult to go to a man and say, we want to cut this off, because they, you know, it was part of their penis and they enjoyed it. But they could convince them, have us do it to your son. Uh, wow. And if you do it to your son, your son is much less able to resist, especially if you're doing it to a baby. Now, one one difference between the UK and the US is in the UK, it was typically done to young children. In the United States, it, it, it's done to infants. Um, so do you think that is because story. of religious reasons, or do you think that's because of some other cultural reason? Uh, Why is it done to infants? It's probably both. It's mostly cultural. So um, in, in the UK, it was... Um, you can you can chart this, but if you look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is really interesting, and you read their entry on circumcision for every decade, you know, in 1800 and 1810 and 1820, it says circumcision is a is a religious rite, a practice of, of Jews and Muslims. And that's what it says in 1860. And in 1870, this changes to, it's a medical procedure, and it's also a ritual. So that's the kind of the critical decade. And... At the time, the medical part of it was for a whole bunch of stuff that we no longer consider, you know, you know, stopping masturbation. There was a disease that is not a disease, but they called spermatorrhea, hmm. or basically. And, and I should say, I come, you can almost understand. You're a doctor. You have to understand. Medical science was in the Middle Ages until the very last decade of the 19th century. They had not discovered germs. They had not discovered microbiology. They had not discovered bacteria or fungus. There had been almost no 
uh, advances in medical, which is very different because we were getting all kinds of advancements in engineering, in physics, in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, metallurgy, in mathematics, all these other sciences. And yet in 1850 and 1860, the medical help that you could get is almost the same as you could have gotten uh, in Roman times or Greek times. And so you have uh, a doctor and there's people getting sick all the time. There was a lot of illness in the 19th century and you see a lot of sick boys and they come in and who knows, they have tuberculosis, they have um, tonsillitis, they have uh, whatever, all kinds of diseases. And then you ask them, hey, do you, do you, do you masturbate? <laughs> you know, all of them are going to say yes, right? Like all of them are going to admit to masturbate and it'll be very, wait a second, every single boy that I saw in here who had tuberculosis yeah masturbated oh maybe you know there's obviously we know logically strictly speaking logically yeah. you know that's a correlation equals causation fallacy but they weren't that rigorous at the time and like, you could almost see it and plus uh there was this uh, belief in in christian theology that uh sexual pleasure outside of marriage and even out and even sometimes outside of uh, impregnating your wife was bad mm. Yeah, yeah. And, well, it was forbidden. It wasn't just bad. It was like a guy got turned into a pillar of salt or something for doing it. Um, onan, which is where we get the word uh, onanism, onanism for onanism. masturbation. Yeah, onan. He was a uh, he. He spilled his seed upon the ground rather than impregnating his uh, his dead brother's wife. Oh. I think. And so God was displeased with that because he wanted onan to have a lot of kids, but he spilled his seed on the ground. So I think he died or some bad thing happened to him. It was actually forbidden by the Bible, but a lot of things have been by the Bible that people do. So you have the, these medical doctors, these physicians who don't really know what causes disease. They don't know how to, they don't have any treatments for it either, right? If you came down with syphilis, like that was it. You were just going to die a horrible death. Uh, and, uh, and yet they also have this association that sexual pleasure is bad. And here's, the, here's something that will be debated now, but a lot of them realize that the foreskin was related to sexual pleasure. Yeah, uh, you can even find. Uh, there's actually some really famous quotes from Aristotle that it's one of the main points of sex. And even uh, there's a famous uh, Jewish rabbi named Maimonides who was not just a rabbi; he was a physician, and he worked in Spain and then he worked in Egypt. And he wrote extensively that uh, the in, the in, the uncircumcised penis is superior. It's sexually superior. It feels better. There's nothing wrong with it. They circumcise for spiritual reasons. The the idea is. Oh well, you won't feel as much sexual pleasure, so you can go and concentrate on the Torah. So you know he favored circumcision because it diminished sexual ability, yeah. and then would allow to focus on 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 other things. And he actually warned Jewish women should not sleep with Gentile men because once they've tried an uncircumcised penis, they will never be satisfied with the circumcision. This is from a Jewish, you know, and there, he's not alone. There's several other Jewish uh, writers and um, intellectuals who believe that. Nowadays, of course, that will be denied absolutely vociferously. Oh no, no, no. You know, circumcision has no effect on sexual pleasure. How that could make any sense when you're removing tissue, whatever. But so these, the, there's this kind of this confluence of sex is bad, sexual pleasure is bad. Uh, we have all have these diseases that we can't really explain and can't really um, take care of. And so circumcision became, and then the other thing is in the 1830s, they did discover antiseptics. They did discover if they used surgery with clean instruments, you know, if they, if they <laughs> boiled the water and everything, that they had much higher survival rates. They didn't know why. Yeah. And so surgery became a big, very popular thing. That's when mm. people, hey, you know, we can do surgery and we won't necessarily kill the patient almost yeah. every time. <laughs> if you did surgery in 1700, yeah. even a very minor surgery, it's going to get infected probably. Yeah, we can do whatever we want to the human body now. We'll just cut it up. So, yeah, yeah I, I would highly recommend. Let's try it. People read, uh, there's a great book called The History of Cancer, The Emperor of All Maladies. Uh, with, you know, which is not about circumcision at all, but it talks about this, this, the doctors going in and you know, like, you know, cutting out the tumors. And they didn't know anything about you know, metastasizing tumors or spreading tumors, but they knew that they could cut. And there was kind of like, they would show off. What could we... Hmm. So circumcision was, hey, we can do this. We can cut this off and maybe that'll help. Now they couldn't convince adult men to do it, but they could convince them to have it done to their sons. And then those sons, when they grow up, and yeah. here's the interesting thing, this isn't ritual circumcision, but... The reason I think circumcision is so popular as a ritual is because it is actually a very powerful surgery. You know, you're taking the penis, which is a very important part of every man's identity or most men's identity, something that they are actively involved with every day, even if they're not masturbating. It's a big part of their identity. And to go and to change that, that's going to have a big impact. 
good or ill, right? Uh, and that I think that's one of the reasons why it's not just the Jews and the Muslims who do circumcision. Like I said, you see it all over, uh, like the Philippines, or which there the practice goes back before the Catholic Catholics arrived. Not the Catholic Catholics don't believe in circumcision, but like uh, or or Melanesia or New Guinea, right? This is a very 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 common procedure, uh, and so when it's done medically, I think you're still imparting that. Um, not religious necessarily, but it's still having the power of of the ritual where that boy who is circumcised for ostensibly medical reasons, uh, he's going to be affected by that. And there's a point when he grows up, he's going to want to spread that himself. And so this is a big difference between the UK and the US. Mm -hmm. It's Basically, a snowball the US effect, was, right? It's a snowball effect. And you have in the US, um, the US is richer than the UK. And so in the U in the UK, right. pretty much only well off, wealthy people got circumcised because you had to pay for it, and poorer people couldn't afford typically. Uh, in the U.S., more people could afford it, and because of the insurance schemes that existed, it actually became very common. And so I think it was around. It increased every decade from the 1870s on, and by 1920, it was over a majority, like over 50 percent of newborns were circumcised. Sorry, just so uh, just on that. Uh, do you know how much it costs to get a, a, a baby circumcised now? Because I have no idea if it's like a hundred dollars or like fifty dollars. Uh, yeah, you know, with insurance and everything. Oh, insurance, what? right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, nobody, yeah, yeah. nobody knows how much it costs. No, I've I've heard. I mean, I don't have any kids. I've heard people saying it can cost a few thousand dollars and also a wow. few hundred dollars. Right. So yeah. there's a big question of how much of this is inflated and whatnot. Um, and it is covered by Medicare, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, in most of the United States, but not all of the United States. So there's a couple of states that actually took it off of Medicaid, the main, um, you know, uh, government program to subsidize healthcare. Has it been and the effect because of that? Oh, absolutely. So the lowest circumcision rates are in California, uh, Oregon, and Washington. Hmm. And of course, a lot of people, oh, that's because they're hippies and they're like, you know, like, well, I mean, that's probably part of it. But the main reason is Medicaid won't pay for it. So if you want one, you can have one, but you have to pay for yourself. It just makes sense that if the government's yeah. no longer pay for them, they just become mm -hmm. less common. Um, that's not the only reason it's going down because it's also gone down in places where it's still covered in Medicaid, but that definitely helped. Uh, but in the U.S., you had over 50% by 1920, and by the 50s, you're talking about you know, 70 80% of all newborns. So in the U.K., uh, when people started to question it really seriously in the 30s and 40s, uh, you had two thirds of the men were still uncircumcised, and so they would be like, "Yeah, that makes sense." But if that same warning goes out to a population of men who are almost all circumcised, they're going to say, "Well, I feel fine," you know. So, and and they have no, they have they attach zero value to the foreskin. They look at it like, "Look, I'm not, I don't have a foreskin, and you know, I I like sex." Mm -hmm. So, you know, who cares if the medical benefits minimal or, or negligent? Negligent. So. Yeah. In the UK, the rates dropped, uh, like I think in 48, 49. Again, there was a very famous report issued by, I forget the name, but a, a, a pediatric doctor there. And he said, look, babies are dying from this and there's no reason. NHS took it off their coverage. And then it just, but you had all these other doctors who, who knew, who were themselves uncircumcised. And that's another thing. When they study the, uh, the likelihood that a doctor would suggest circumcision correlates extremely strongly as if the doctor is himself circumcised. Wow. Uncircumcised doctors are much less likely to uh, encourage. They'll still do them if parents come and say yeah, we want yeah. this. There's not many doctors who will say no, although there are some who will. Um, but if the if the parent asks, doctors who are circumcised are much more likely. And there's a there's a point where they start making completely non medical. So I, I, you hear stories of parents going in, and the doctors are like, "Well, do you want your son circumcised?" And they'll say, uh, "Not really." And the doctor will be like, "Well, here's the medical reasons." And the parents will say, none of those are very conv convincing. And then they'll say, well, don't you want, you don't want your son to stand out in school. I'm like, well, wait a second. That has nothing to do. That's not a medical yeah. no decision at all. That's not a medical rationale. And then they'll say, one of the stories I read, uh, the doctor said, well, you don't want him to look like you, don't you, to, mm. to the father. You want your son to look like you. Again, that's not a medical decision at all. And the, 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 in that case, the father said, well, I'm actually uncircumcised, so there you punch it. He's going to be uncircumcised, mm -hmm. too. But what, you have to wonder why would that – and I'm not going to say all doctors are like this, but why would a doctor be so motivated? And there's obviously – well, he'll charge, he'll make money, but I think it's more than that. I think there's a – it's a perpetuating mean. 
Um, I know in Australia, when the dr- circumcision rates dropped in Australia, and after you got to the point where the large majority of newborns were not being circumcised, there was a backlash among men who had already been circumcised. Hmm. Uh, and in fact, one of the most outspoken proponents of circumcision isn't an American, it's an Australian named Brian Morrison, who was basically saying all children should be circumcised and that if you don't circumcise your kids, you're probably bad parents. Uh, and he's, he's circumcised. Yeah. Uh, and there's a sense of, this could be highly debated, and I, you know, there's speculation here, so I don't want to make statements and uh, say that they're completely solid, but um, we know that when you inflict trauma on people, the, there's a likelihood that they will also inflict that trauma. Classic mm. case, if you abuse a child sexually or just physically, the, the chances that they are going to perpetuate that abuse skyrocket. Uh, now, um, children who are circumcised as infants, they're not going to have a conscious memory of that, but they're going to know that it happened. Uh, they're pro- they are subjected to some trauma. Again, what the long-term effects of the trauma are is basically unknown at this point. Um, I would hesitate to say, I, it seems very unlikely that it's zero, but that doesn't say anything about where it would actually be. Um, yeah. But then they have an incentive to try, and, and there's, there's another thing where fathers, they don't want to feel emasculated relative to their sons, right? They're older, they know when their sons grow up, their sons are going to be younger and fitter than they are at some point. And then the idea that their son has a complete penis and it has everything there, whereas they don't, where they've been sexually diminished in some sense, even if they don't want to admit it, it's in the back of your head. Mm. Part of it was cut I off. Think, you know, yeah, you- I think that's I think that's speculating. I'm not saying it's not true, but uh, yeah, I, I think what's interesting is uh, what I always thought would be a good motivator to circumcise if you are yourself circumcised is the idea that if you, if your parents did it to you, your parents probably loved you and you probably love your parents, right? You don't want to believe that they did something wrong to you or that even unnecessary. So you don't want to think of your father as making the wrong decision for you. So you're going to be like, well, what would my father do in this situation? Oh, yeah, he had me circumcised. I'm going to do what he did because he was a good dad. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, going to circumcise my kid as well. I've, I've heard of uh, parents who decide not to do it and then their relatives are like, hey, this is a tradition. You know, this, mm. And this is and not even necessarily religious. right? These wouldn't be Jewish families, but they're just saying, hey, all the men in our family are this way. So... And then this gets into the issue. So because all the men in the family are this way, do parents have the right then to mark their child in that way to remove, um, you know, see the ethics here. People understand that parents can make choices for their children's health. You know, if they need to uh, give them surgery to remove a tumor or, you know, something like that. There's, there's a lot of ethical consensus that that's all right. But when we start talking about a cosmetic surgery to remove healthy tissue, that's people. Well, there's almost there's consensus on that, that that's wrong. With one exception, yeah. and that's if circumcise a boy. You certainly can't do that to a girl, but you can do that to a boy. And there, I've never heard an argument for circumcision that wasn't special pleading that wouldn't wouldn't allow for all. Oh, so you wanted to yeah. let's take the clothes off. You know, you don't need those. You can still have kids without your earlobe. People will be like, that's so terrible. <laughs> that's awful. But there's no Meisner's corpuscles in your earlobes. You know. Uh, yeah. or, uh, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put your scalping video at the end of this one in the end screen because it was so it was so on point because it was just you delivered it completely straight faced like these are all the reasons why scalping is a good idea which is just the, yeah, the, I mean, the reasons why people talk about circumcision being a good idea. Like the, the most of the arguments, some of the arguments for circumcision are completely blunt, but most of them have a grain of truth. You know, it, mm-hmm. if you remove the foreskin, you'll never have an issue with your foreskin. You know, yeah. that's that's true, and you can. You know, foreskins are not a magic part of your body. They're they're prone. They can have problems, just like every other part of your body. Uh, and it's just like the problems that are associated with it, though, are quite minor. The, the uh, UTIs, urinary tract infect- infections, they're not a very serious problem, and they're not particularly common among boys. It's like one percent or two percent. Girls get them much more, and no one says, "Well, maybe if we could circumcise girls and reduce UTIs." And I'm not sure that circumcision in girls would even. I don't think it would. <laughs> you know, this is the, what's so interesting there is you couldn't even do the research there, right? If you said, let's study it, yeah. you know, let's, let's yeah. circumcise it. It's not ethical. It, was, it would be completely unethical. But if you want to do it to boys, it would not be unethical. And similar to these, um, nowadays, the main argument people use are these HIV studies in Africa. And uh, that really bothers me because I, I think that's um, a rationalization. I was born before those studies were taken. That the, I was not circumcised because of studies in Africa, and, and in fact, nobody is getting circumcised because of studies in Africa. Those are just rationalizations yep. 
for continuing to get it done. But, you know, when they did those studies, it's fascinating. You know, they have a cohort of men who they circumcise as adults and a cohort of men who they leave intact. And there's lots of problems with the studies. They were giving the men who were circumcised condoms. Like, <laughs> at, and, and at the end of the day, uh, the circumcised men caught HIV slightly less than the uncircumcised men. It was both were low. I think it was like 2% of the uncircumcised men got HIV and 1% of yeah, the yeah. circumcised. So and so then Eric Hover talked about that as well. It was a it was a one percent difference between the groups, yeah, an ultimate work, difference, but a relative difference of fifty yeah. percent. And the the people who did the study said it's basically like an immunization. I'm like, well, I don't know any other immunization that's only fifty percent effective. Yeah. And the problem with the study is like they're giving the men who are circumcised condoms. I think they were uh, teaching them how to use condoms. I think oh, we're talking about the same study. And I think they I think they gave them both condoms, but they taught. Because the people who were circumcised, they had to teach them how to use condoms again. Uh, uh, yeah. Because it was like they, they needed re-educating. They had to return to the hospital for medical checkups because they had surgery, mm. right? And those checkups yeah. they would give condoms, so so they had more oh, okay. medical. Interesting. Yeah, and um, which doesn't necessarily explain, but it also throws a monkey wrench in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, like and and, and but what's fascinating is, but they knew some of the circumcised men were catching HIV. And they didn't stop the study. They said, look, let's let the study go through because it looked like the results were going to show that circumcision you know, might have had an effect. Mm -hmm. uh, they did another study, but this was only measuring female to male, you know, negative males with positive females. They did another study measuring do uh, positive men who get circumcised, do they transmit it more or less to, to women who are negative? And in that study, it started to show that the circumcised men were spreading it more than the uncircumcised men. Yeah, now, that makes that sense true, anatomically. If that was true, it would negate the possibility of... Right, but then what they did is they said, that's unethical, and they ended that study. Yeah. So if you have a study that shows that circumcision might be beneficial, people getting HIV is fine. But if you have a study that shows that circumcision might actually make it easier to catch HIV, then it's mm. unethical, it must be stopped. So they were. It, it, there's a lot of evidence that the people who did that study went to Africa to try and find a reason to justify circumcision. Yeah. Um, I almost think it's not even worth talking about because although it is something that um, circumcision proponents will talk about, it's just not um, it's just not something I think people find convincing. It's like most people don't consider themselves, they don't consider HIV to be a risk in their life. They're not planning on catching HIV. I know that's stupid, yeah, but I, I feel like, like that's not actually very persuasive. If you... <laughs> And in the U.S., most of HIV is associated with being homosexual, mm -hmm. and these studies didn't study that at all. Um, mm -hmm. most homosexuals catch it from anal intercourse, and if you are bottoming, it doesn't matter if... The, yeah, if you're circumcised <laughs> like, or not. Yeah. It doesn't matter at all. So, uh, the, the, you know, even if these studies were valid, and I don't think that they were, they don't translate to the first world. You know, it's yeah, totally it's, different. it's not a first world problem. Uh, yeah. So, some people have described circumcision as a cure in search of a disease. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, initially it's for murderia and stopping onanism, and then they realize that's not true. So then they say, oh, well, it protects you from uh, syphilis, which we know that's not true. And then they said, well, uh, it will make you cleaner. And this is a, this is another kind of interesting his medical history uh, aside. They still didn't understand germs, but they did know in the 1840s and 50s, you know, if we clean out the city, if we put a sewer, if we drain everything, if we get rid of the standing stagnant water, you know, rates of uh, cholera and typhus go down. You know, that you could reduce disease. So there was a big reduction in mortality from disease in the 19th century, not from treatment, not from antibiotics, which yeah. had not yet been discovered, making things clean. And so then there was a craze of make the body clean, make okay. the body clean. And that's when smegma became the enemy number one, and that if you, you know, your foreskin can trap dirt, you know. And you'll even hear this today. A lot of people say, uh, like they're like political writers. This is very odd. Political writers will say stuff like, "We should circumcise our boys so that um, when they are in the military and they have to get deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, they don't get sand stuck in their foreskins." Mm. And it, it, it seems so ridiculous, but you know that's the the hoop people will jump through. And it goes back to this: keep it clean, and foreskins are dirty. And this is when you talk to pro circumcision people, and what we were taught: foreskins are dirty, circumcised dicks are clean. Yeah. And and that's a big reason. That's a big justification. But I think at this point, it's just a cultural thing. 
the dad is circumcised, the grandpa is circumcised, the yeah. brothers are circumcised, so the son is circumcised. And you can debunk every single one of those, and you can, it, it, but that's it not matter. what's, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's now a cultural practice. And I think it's even a cultural practice among Jews, because you have Jews who don't believe in God, who don't wear, don't follow the Sabbath, who don't follow um, kosher. kosher. Yeah, they don't, they don't. They don't do any. They don't cover their head. They don't go to temple. They don't go to. They don't even believe in God, and they still get circumcised. That's not religious at that point. That's cultural. Uh, yeah, I think there. Then just uh, as a point of, um, I don't know, use of language. I I've started using the word uh, religious to like not just in strictly religious terms, but describing these behaviors that are cultural, that are what do you say not rational. Um, I think you can describe those as religious behaviors, even when they're not specifically theological. Religious, theological, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And th this comes up in the debate when I'll point out female circumcision, and people will say, "Well, female circumcision is different because it's not religious, right? So it's not protected by religious freedom." It's like people That's from stupid. East Africa, <laughs> yeah, they believe they believe that it's well, yeah, it is stupid because why does the exception <laughs> you can do? It? anything as long as you can say it's religious that doesn't make a lot of sense but yeah there it's not meaningfully not religious like you're saying yeah yeah it's stupid for like every single reason <laughs> yeah uh th th there's just a concerted effort to make sure that the two are distinct because female circumcision is considered barbaric and wrong and male circumcision is considered like good or at least yeah. neutral uh, and yeah. so comparing it's one of those things like you've made up your mind without knowing why and then you make up you use all these facts and statistics and these arguments that you've picked up to justify what you already think uh it's, you know po post hoc rationalizing the opinion uh, that you've already taken and you might have actually taken steps to um to circum like if you've if you've in the past circumcised someone or supported circ circumcision and you've also already um been dismissive or you know you've been critical of female circumcision you're going to want to back up those actions you've already taken with yeah, they, these arguments jonathan height in his great book the righteous mind says you know humans have the emotional and they have the logical and we tend to think oh the logical you know is in control and the emotions kind of pop up here and there and mm -hmm. this is the opposite the emotions yeah, yeah. control what we feel you know we feel an intuitive you know, so if we're talking about politics, we, we intuitively believe, you know, that universal health is a good idea. Or we intuitively believe that there's a God. And then our, our logical brain does everything it can to rationalize yeah. the impulse of our, our emotions. And that's not, I mean, look, everyone is capable of being the other way sometimes. And I'm sure there's a spectrum where some people are more or less, you know, so like yeah. maybe for people with Asperger's might be more logical than, you know, whatever. But, um, it's it's very similar. So you can go and argue against every single point, but people just believe, hey, I just believe this is right, and I don't care if you point out any problems with the study or talk about nerve endings or any of that other stuff. I just feel like it's right. And like you pointed yeah. out, if you've been done, and somebody's telling you that, hey, you may have committed a rights violation, or you may have, and they've actually done surveys, rights violations doesn't bother anyone. People yeah. are totally happy with rights violations. But you know, if you say you hurt your child. That's the argument that works the best, by the way, when they you know, they tell mothers, hey, you are actually hurting the baby. Be before they do the circumcision. Before they do it, yep. Yeah. Like, that's the main, that's the most persuasive. There's a couple arguments, and all of them work a little. That's the most persuasive. Um, but if they've already had it done, they're going to get real defensive as, wait, you're saying I'm a bad person? Yeah. You're saying, you know, that I, if you're saying that circumcision is like rape or like sexual assault, and it's weird because if you're if you're saying you're in the hospital and the doctor goes down before the circumcision, goes, hey, look, I'm just gonna, um, you know, touch it a little bit and play with it a little bit. That would be a serious, yeah. like that would be a serious crime. No but parent would be, allow it. That, no, that would be a serious, serious crime and a scandal. And yet that won't leave any after effect at all, you know. But then if he goes, he goes, oh no, I'm just gonna cut off, you know, the most sensitive part without anesthetics. Um, that's considered like okay, mm -hmm. uh, and that I think that, and, and a, a huge part of the problem here though is we have so many doctors who are going to defend the practice, and a big part of the reason they're going to defend it is if it's seriously questioned, then they are, if not legally culpable, and financially culpable, at least morally culpable. Yeah, nobody wants to 
I've been doing this and it's been, you know, uh, harmful. And, uh, and so they, oh, no, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's good. You know, right, right, right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the um, biggest problems, I think, with uh, Eric Klopper's lecture is that he, um, uh, I've heard it called um, uh, selling past the close. Like he he really doubled down on calling it a um, a violent sexual act of, of circumcision and uh, calling it brutal, savage. He used a lot of very impassioned language yeah. to describe the people doing it, the people um, propagating it. And I think it was just completely the wrong way to go. It just it, people don't want to be called those things. You can tell people that they're wrong and that they've been scientifically. Uh, that their their evidence isn't quite right, and perhaps they were mistakenly doing these things. But I don't think anybody's going to be, um, especially if they've if they've had it done to their children or if they're doing them themselves. They, you know, they're, they're surgeons. They're not going to be persuaded by those kinds of arguments, calling them perverts, calling them you know savages. Right. Uh, it's they're, it's just yeah, not they're persuasive. Gonna get defensive and they're going to shut you out. Yeah, and uh, um, I don't know Eric. Clapper very well. I've met him once. It's a small and tactless community. He was not too far from me. Um, and I like his show, but I, I agree that some of the tactics, it, it's difficult because I think it's one, I agree, like, I think it is a sexual assault. I think it is a huge rights violation. I think you are damaging the child for life. Uh, I think it's, it's a horrible thing to do, especially if you're aware, right? There's a lot of people who do it and they just don't know. And it's very hard to get angry at a person who just doesn't know any better. They're just trying to do their best for their kid. It's, or they're just that, trying to, yes. yeah. And, and they don't know. They haven't looked into it. Um, you know, people who do look into it, tend the, the likelihood that they will not do it goes way up. It doesn't go to 100%. There's plenty of people who look in and still get it done. But there's, you know, if I think if you look at people who did any research before, I think the rates go way down. But, yeah, they don't know any better. And the doctor says it's a good idea. You know, that's not a malicious decision on their part. Hmm. Um, it's... You know, it's a very harmful decision, but it's not a malicious one. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, so I don't. For, so for my parents, I don't feel any anger towards my parents. I wish that it had not happened. I think it's a tragic cir circumstance that it happened, but it wasn't something that they were equipped, especially in the age before the internet, to to really know any better. Very yeah. likely. So there's some who did. Um, so I think that that level of vitriol is counterproductive, but I will say among intactivists, among men who really resent what happened to them, that's not an uncommon feeling. There is. Yeah, I can faith. understand it, of course. And in his case, it sounds like based on what he disclosed in that um, presentation, that he's, he has confronted his parents about it. And they basically said, we did the right thing. You're wrong. Yeah, they doubled okay. down on it. Yeah. And that you could see how that could en enrage you. And, and in terms of the. I mean, he, he really does flirt with anti-Semitism in that thing. In that thing. Mm -hmm. But I've seen in, in debates uh, where, uh, like on Facebook or on Reddit, where um, people will admit that none of the medical justifications are real, that it's a rights violation, that you're harming the child, that, you know, and then they'll say, we should be allowed to do it anyway because we're Jewish. Right? I've, I've actually seen people say, this is the, this is the part of the Jewish identity if we if we don't have circumcision, we don't have Jews anymore, which is not true, but that's the way they feel it, and they think, look, even if it is a rights violation, we should be permitted to do it anyway to perpetuate, you know, our culture. And this mm -hmm. is again from a guy who's an atheist. Like, well, that that is kind of infuriating. Like, yeah. I can see why because you're based like at least the people who say no, it's it's beneficial and it's not harmful. Well, they're wrong, but at least if that was true. You know, then their argument makes sense. Is at least logical. But these people, are, there, there are plenty of people, and there's even there's stories. It's, I'm sure it's rare, but there are moils, the guys who do the circumcisions, who will say, you know, this is a horrible rights violation, but you know, it's a commandment from God, so we're going to do it anyway. At least he's being intellectually honest. You know, and say, yeah. well, I'm doing this because the creator of the universe told me to. So you know, I don't. Doesn't matter if mm -hmm. you can talk about nerves or whatever. You know, God told me to. Um, so I can, I can under, I don't know how much of that Eric has to, has had to deal with and I'm not going to make excuses for it, but you can understand why there would be a lot of rage there. Yeah. And there's also a lot of rage because doctors will just say, get over it. Mm -hmm. You know, so like if you lost any other part of your body and you said, Hey, I feel upset about this. Oh yeah. Let's, you know, therapy and maybe there's something we can do, you know, Oh, you're a woman. Yeah. We can do stuff to make it like you have breasts again or whatever, a prosthetic arm. 
Um, men who are upset about being circumcised are just told to grow up, stop being a baby. Like, it's no big deal. You should feel fine. You know, there's something wrong with you for being, mm-hmm. uh, who, caring about this. Uh, and so that frustrates a lot of people. Um, you know, and I don't know if that's what's happened to him. But yeah, that that is an entertaining show. But I, I and I, I hated the article I read about it, basically ignored everything he said about circumcision and just said, He's an anti-Semite. Yeah, that is the problem with that. When even when you flirt with anti-Semitism, you're giving room for your critics to just attack you for that. It's like you you have to be perfect, and then they have to confront your arguments. He flaunted his Jew card, and yeah. I think he. Was, I think he, he I, thought that would let yeah. him get away with it. And I'm sure it helped because if he hadn't done that, I'm sure it would have been much 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 worse. Mm. Or, you know, um, but it's. Apparently, it didn't help him too much because he lost his job. But yeah, um, it doesn't matter. Apparently. Yeah, like, um, so. Can I just I, say because about anti-Semitism, like I think you're right in that he does. Um, it's definitely somewhat hateful what he's going into, and it does. It's it's like almost not really, but it's like almost an incitement to violence. Like t- saying that these people are basically rapists. Um, but I think to call it anti-Semitism, you'd have to say that he hated circumcision because it was Jewish, not he hated Jews because, Jewish of, circumcision. because of circumcision. Yeah, that, that would be anti-Semitism, right? If he hated something for being Jewish. Yeah, but now you're, you're being too like logical and having actual definite definitions yeah. of these terms, and that's kind of not the point of these terms anymore. Mm-hmm. These, they're supposed to be non-specific blatant, blatant slanders. Yeah, I'm just, th- um, you know, just for, just for my own uh, <laughs> sense of, uh, you know, of my opinion of this guy. Uh, which I, is, you know, kind of mixed. It is interesting in the context, so the United States is unusual in that the vast majority of people are Gentiles or not Jewish. And so it, I find it interesting when we have a debate about circumcision in the United States, people will pull out the Jewish question. And it's like, this. let's just even, con- let's concede that and say, sure, yeah. Jews can circumcise. What about the 98% of everybody else? You know, where does that put us? It's kind of like mm. the uh, anti-abortion or the pro-abortion people will say, what about rape? I'm like, okay, yeah. fine, let's concede rape. Are you against all other abortions? And the answer is almost always no. They want abortions for everyone, even mm-hmm. even the ones where rape is not a question. And yeah. the the similar the people who say, "What about religious freedom?" Those people favor circumcision for everyone, including people who are not Jewish or who are atheist or who you know are saying we're not doing this for religious reasons. So I I feel like that really muddles the water a lot. And I yeah. also think that it is this point. It's a cultural practice, even among like there are. Some Jews are circumcised ritually with a moil, you know, out, outside of the hospital. That does happen. It's not particularly rare either, but it's not even a majority of Jews. So most are just getting it done for cultural reasons. Uh, and I don't know. You basically just have to change the culture. And it seems like it, in the United States it started to change because the rates have dropped a lot. You know, they've dropped from 80 or 90 percent to 50 or 60 percent in the last 20 years. That's yeah. a fairly big change. So the United yeah. States is probably on course to be one of probably the most mixed country in the world in turn in this regard you know compared to anywhere else although there's enormous regional variation so california it's become relatively rare the midwest it's still super common um and you know that's an interesting question why that would be in you know i Mm -hmm. I actually have an answer but Mm -hmm. yeah it is a really fascinating topic um yeah i think um now should be the time for this to end just because of the internet We've got so much access to information, but you've also got so much access to anecdotal, you know, experience from other people from other cultures. Circumcised people can talk to uncircumcised people. You know, yeah. women women who've had sex with both can share their experiences. We we really shouldn't be there shouldn't be a stigma about foreskins because there's so many people in the world who don't care at all about foreskins and who might even enjoy them. Yeah, the very the very first conversation I had with an uncircumcised person was a friend of mine in Iceland, a straight friend. And I asked him the same question, do you get sick, you know, and he said no, that was, he, yeah, you know, yeah. he didn't know, not only did he say no, he didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. You know, because it, I was completely ignorant. And then it was a little awkward because he was straight and I was gay, but, uh, you know, I was asking, what, well, what does it feel like? Well, that's a, that's like an impossible question to verbalize um, your physical sensation and then mm-hmm. also to distinguish it between the sensations of another person who you've never firsthand felt, yeah. you know. This is extreme, like our language is not really up to that Mm -hmm. level, you know, Um, and, but, you know, he gave it a shot. And I remember I said, well, what, what's the best feeling you can have? And 
he said, um, I like it if my girlfriend goes and just kisses the tip, you know, just a light kiss on it. And a circumcised, a circumcised man, if you lightly kiss the tip of his penis, may not even feel it. Like he may not even know that that has happened. And if he does feel it, it's going to feel like, you know, like yeah. a, it's not going to be erogenous. You're not going to get a kiss on the tip of your, your circumcised dick and go, oh, fuck yeah. Sorry. I'm not to, like, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, go for like, it. We're so deep into this that yeah, I'm sure yeah. that most people well, who aren't into it. Here, they here's can't. this, you know, this guy telling me that just getting a light kiss on the tip, you know, he says his whole body shudders and he melts. You know, that he, can I just he, say I never imagined in a million years that two men would have a conversation like that. Like, I'm, you know, I don't get to see men talking alone because if I'm well, there, maybe, then they're different. But <laughs> that's so that's so bizarre. You know, Homo sapiens have been around for a couple hundred thousand years, so you know it has been a million years, and the chance finally came. Sure, but you're right. <laughs> I was like, oh, so is that? So I'm thinking, like, gosh, you know, if someone kisses the tip of my dick, I don't feel anything, you know, and I certainly wouldn't like start to, you know, tremble and moan, mm. you know, which is he was saying. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And then I said, so is that like the best feeling you can have? He's like, oh no, the best feeling is when I pull the skin on and off the head. There's a big okay. A circumcised man has never felt that and has no analogous feeling to that. And yet here's this guy telling me it's the best feeling he can have. And he goes, and when you have sex, that's that's what's happening, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and then, of course, every time he jerks off, that's what's happening. And that's what really got the wheels turning in my head. Whoa, this guy is saying that this is the best thing he can feel, and I don't feel anything yeah, what? these are the conversations that change people's minds, not like HIV statistics, but, you know? But they're difficult conversations uh, in most contexts. I've had yeah. these conversations with people I knew pretty well, and that, you know, and these people were not random. These are people I had known for months or years before I broached the subject, uh, which is one reason I'm more uh, relaxed about discussing it publicly, just because I think not enough people are having the discussion. Mm. Uh, and. Uh, even though th it's certainly taboo uh, and to an extent and not like taboo like we're ostracizing you from society but taboo is like it's not, it's not polite and you should you know yeah. and people feel uh, even even doing this feels a little awkward um, but you know I've, I've heard you talk about penises so much it's not awkward for me but okay. <laughs> it's a way, you can have you certainly can have um, you can have it be platonic um, you know, so and you, and be as analytical as possible. But you know, it's it's an it's a, an erogenous sexual experience, and so to sanitize it too much, you can kind of rob it of some of the power. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. Uh, and and like one and since we're on that topic, you know, when when I've met uncircumcised men, um, they are, I, the, their orgasms are qualitatively better. Um, and I'll, I'll describe, this doesn't happen to all of them. So if some uncircumcised guys see this and, you know, but, um, a lot of them will ex ex describe feelings of like synesthesia where they see sparks, see, um, you know, like the fireworks or colors, uh, and then feel, uh, like tingling on the lower back, on the extremities, sometimes all over the body. Uh, and again, I haven't seen this with every single uncircumcised guy ever. Um, but, and sometimes they'll start shaking and quivering and sometimes for minutes, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes after that, even though that doesn't happen to all uncircumcised guys, that never happens with circumcised guys. I've never had a, a circumcised guy say, I saw stars. I saw synesthesia. I felt tingling on my back or on my extremities, you know, uh, and it's not hard to imagine what the difference is there. Cause it's at this point. It's anecdotal, but I've never had a circumcised guy ever, mm. you know, experience or describe something like that. Whereas uncircumcised guys, it's not everybody, but it's not uncommon either. Yeah. Um, and it just yeah. makes sense. They have more stuff there. They have I mean, another way to put it for guys who are circumcised. Imagine that you have your body has its own fleshlight. And when you're having sex with it, not only are you you're feeling the inside of the fleshlight and the inside at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. That's a, not something that a circumcised guy can even like really imagine, uh, yeah. and it, it. But just describing it, you imagine it probably feels pretty good. Um, yeah, I think um, it's it, when when some people hear these kind of conversations, you know, you're talking about like better orgasms or whatever. Like it, some people might have an instinct to say like. 
that's just that's just being you're being shallow like who really cares about orgasms there's more to life than orgasms but that's what I my think, that's what my monody said hey yeah. this is great because it reduces it reduces sexual pleasure and now you can focus on mm. the more important yeah. things but i think um i without getting too i don't know graphic here but i think um, I've got that kind of, uh, I've been taught by sex in the city that sex is actually really important to relationships. And that is just, that's mostly a joke, right? But it is, it's serious. Like the being, having satisfying sex in a relationship, a long-term relationship, if you're trying to build a, you know, a lifetime relationship where you're going to have sex hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, I don't know, if that's the lucky you are. But it's, you know, if you're having better sex, you'd probably be more satisfied in your relationship in, you know, we feel more loved, you know, just having, sharing those well, moments together of joy. So it's, among, it's not trivial. No, it's not trivial at all. Uh, and again, the idea that the parents could make that decision for their son just is ridiculous. Like it's, uh, you know, it's a totally different question if you're talking about a consenting adult saying, Hey, I would rather have less powerful orgasms. So I'm going to get circumcised. Okay, I think that's dumb, but like they're well within their rights to do that. But for the yeah. parents coming to a newborn and say, "Hey, you know, this is what we want," but there's actually um, among the devices that people use to restore, uh, one of the more popular ones is called a TLC tugger, and it was created by a guy named Ron Lowe. <coughs> and I'm not—he's talked about this publicly, so I'm not revealing anything. But you know, he was an engineer, uh, and he was a middle-aged, like in his 40s, early 50s, and he started to lose. He—he he was married, had kids. And he started to have uh, problems with erectile dysfunction, and he could. He started to get to the point where he lost so much sensitivity that he he couldn't really achieve orgasm with his wife, and it was really bad for their relationship. It was frustrating, mm -hmm. you know. If they tried to have sex and he couldn't come, that's frustrating. Yeah, if it happens once, oh, no big deal. It happens every time, it's a big deal. And it was bad for her too because then she started to think, "Am I?" Did I get, you know, am I no longer able to satisfy my husband? Did I, you know, get too old? Am I just not good at it anymore? Is he, maybe he's attracted to somebody else and it's not me. And he was feeling like, oh, I'm not really a man, you know, like a, for a man to not be able to come, it's emasculating, you know, and he was going to sex therapy, doing all this research. And eventually he discovered foreskin restoration. He restores his foreskin. Uh, he's shown pictures. It looks like it's uncut. The one... There are differences between a uncircumcised and a restored penis, but restored ones, once they're finished, aesthetically look indistinguishable and functionally are very, very close. But you can't get that but, frenulum back, can you? The connection that, won't be there anymore. That's true. That's true. It's functionally very close, and that's why I okay. said very close. All right. Not I just want to make sure I understood what was going on. <laughs> there's no frenulum, and then there's also, um, like, the most sensitive part of the foreskin is the ringed band or the ridge band at the tip. Uh, and that is not only sensitive, but it's there's musculature there, and it's like a it's like a sphincter or a muscle. It holds it like like a pucker, like it's an elastic thing that holds it to the head. That's removed in force in during circumcision, and when you restore, you can't get that back. Now it tends to kind of adhere to the skin to the the head anyway, so it looks right, but it's not it's not all there. It's it's a facsimile. It's not the real thing. Mm -hmm. Um. But anyway, so he restored his foreskin, and now you know he reports that sex is better, and and that they have a, a happier relationship. And you know he's selling his product, so there's that, and there's the placebo effect, and yep. whatever. So the, the, there are there are grains of salt that you need to take with that. But and since we're talking about it, you know, I I'm an active foreskin restorationist, uh, and like I've noticed huge changes in my sexual function and uh, uh, pleasure. Uh, and again, I acknowledge there's a placebo, there's an ideological element to that. Um, but in my case, the, the changes were so dramatic that I have a hard time saying it's all that. That's the only thing. Like there's a functional difference. There's things I could not do before that I can do now. Yeah. Um, and given the fact that there's a physical change that accompanies that, it's very hard to say, well, it's all in your head. Because there's actually, there is actually a physical difference that's happened to. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not, it's not trivial. That. The fact that you can have sex with your wife you know, longer mm -hmm. uh, and, and into a later age, that's good. The fact that you can enjoy it better, the, ta the the fact that you can have a stronger orgasm. You know, it's one thing to just have an orgasm. Be, and this is like before I restored, when I had orgasms, it was like, boop, done, eh, no big deal. You know, and now they're really intense. Well, uh, when you share a really intense orgasm with somebody, that's a lot more intimate than if it's like, eh, like, yeah. you know, like that's not, that's not trivial. 
like you said, that that's actually fairly significant. And yeah. if you're talk, even even one orgasm, like yeah, that's that's pretty good. You're talking about every orgasm you have in your life. That's that's pretty significant, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Potentially, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, I suppose we'll wrap this up, but I just wanted to ask you if you saw that thread on um, on Reddit where someone I don't know if you've seen that that subreddit is called What Is This Thing, and someone posted a picture of a foreskin restorer that their their teenage son left in their car. Did you see it? Uh, oh, I never saw that. Did, did people explain what it was? Or? Yeah, yeah. It was like, I, I thought that the thread would get a little bit more um, like flame war with people talking about circumcision, but people were just like, don't talk to him about it. Just let him do his thing. <laughs> you know, like it It was like, a, uh, I didn't know what it was either because I'd, I'd, I'd heard about foreskin restoration, yeah, but it just looks like it, some weird no. doodad. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, they're not the most intuitive devices. When you look at them, you would not... Oh, it's obvious what that is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, it was the uh, perfect candidate for what is this thing subreddit. 